Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, kia ora, everybody. Um, as we say in New Zealand, um, hello, as we say in England, and um, thank you so much for the invitation. It's very kind of you to have me here. I also would like to acknowledge the fact that we're on the territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh so nations, um, and it's been great to explore the area with my family over the last few days. So I thought um, what I'd do today over the next 40 minutes or so is to sort of look at the recent and over the last 10 years or so literature of both vulval cancer and its precursors and to think about how that shapes our practice and um, also to sort of see where we should be going from there and then to talk a bit about what we do in Auckland because we have changed things probably over the last four or five years based on a lot of the evidence that I'm going to present to you today. So I guess the question is, is why do we do what we do? Um, because there's not one single randomized controlled trial or level one evidence in anything to do with vulval cancer. And generally we do what we do because our professor taught us that way, or you read a book, or as the medical oncologists are forever telling me, it's all right for you surgeons, you see a new technique and give it a bit of a go. <laughs> Whereas um, we have to go through robust clinical trials. And it's very true. And surgery is developed for sort of more organically within vulval cancer over the last sort of hundred or so years. Um, but a lot of the evidence that we've got has been on the emphasis on reducing morbidity rather than changing outcomes. And for many years until relatively recently, the literature has put all vulval cancers together, finally got around to putting squamous separately, but still there was no recognition of the different biology. And this sort of idea of we're treating what are really very different diseases with this sort of one size fits all um, approach is probably outdated and needs challenging. Because probably the most um, important thing that's happened over the last few years is the recognition that we have two very different diseases within vulval squamous cell carcinoma that's related to your HPV status. And these tend to affect slightly different populations and certainly have different outcomes. Um, but it wasn't until now four years ago that the WHO sort of um, put out the new classification recognizing that we should be using HPV as a um, way of distinguishing between the different groups of cancers. Um, and they suggested that we used immunohistochemistry of P16, P53 to divide into HPV associated and independent, recognizing that these are different groups of women. Um, they have different responses to radiation and different prognoses. Um, and so FIGO a year later then suggested that we should be documenting the, and this is the first mention the fact that we should be documenting the HPV status um, using P16. However, when they classified the new staging where they simplified it from eight uh, down to eight groups that were supposedly based on prognosis, they've still put everything together because we don't have much data about the two different groups separately. So we've still got all cancers together, but we do need to define what we're treating because the staging doesn't necessarily account for the biology of the disease. So traditionally, we had classified the tumors based on the precursors that were adjacent to the cancers. And often, particularly with something like differentiated bin, it had been subtle, and you hadn't actually realized beforehand. And it, it was always assumed that the majority of cancers were non-HPV and due to lichen sclerosis. And certainly um, when I was taught, I was taught that sort of two thirds to three quarters would be due to um, lichen sclerosis and the rest due to HPV. Um, however, we look back to older data, when we look at the prevalence of VIN, the HPV and um, VIN being used as an umbrella term for all the precursors at the time, um, the HPV associated disease was far more prevalent, although it was recognized that DVIN was increasing, or more to the point, the D recognition of DVIN was probably increasing as we moved into this century. Um, 
And we knew that there was a strong association with cancers. And this was something I did when I was a fellow and we looked at nearly 600 women with the precursors and see whether they ever had a cancer at any point. And DVIM was associated with cancer in 85% of the time. But a lot of that was because it hadn't been recognized before the cancer had been diagnosed and then was found adjacent to the tumor. So we've got a high risk association that is far more likely to become malignant than its HPV counterpart. And certainly in our series, and the Dutch series, it was three to six times more likely. Um, whereas if you look at lichen sclerosis on its own, the risk seems to be relatively lower if you haven't got DB. So if you've just got lichen sclerosis, although your risk increases with time, and that's probably due to the fact that you then develop DB with patients with just lichen sclerosis and that's uncomplicated, their lifetime risk was about three to five percent. But a lot of the things that were diagnosed as lichen sclerosis were probably DB. And this was an interesting um, study that Hedwig van der Udenhoff did in the Netherlands, um, where she took um, two groups of lichen sclerosis patients. One group had developed cancer, the other hadn't and looked back at the pathology and actually found that nearly half of the group that developed a cancer actually would have had a diagnosis of DBIM had they been um, in modern times. So it was this under recognition. Um, and the original um, case series of 12 patients showed that cancer was developing in the, the region of DBIM. And certainly our series as well showed that we got a series of patients who'd got biopsy proven DV and who then later went on to develop cancer. And with those, it was an average of about three and a half years with this strong association with HPV negative status and lichen sclerosis. And so this was work that the Dutch did a couple of years ago um, where they showed that your risk over time increased much more quickly with the differentiated VIN and after 10 years, half of the patients with DBIN had developed cancer, whereas about 10% of the HPV um, patients has. And Hot Off the Press published this month, they've then gone back and um, probably based on work that was done here, gone back and looked at the um, P53 mutations within their HPV independent VIN group and have found the same pattern that we see in the cancers with that if you've got a mutation in your P53, then you have a worse prognosis than you do if you've got wild type, but both of those are still worse than the HPV associated um, precursors. So all of this about DVIN underpins the recommendations from ESCO and the ISSBD who published these guidelines um, year before last um, to say that if you've got DVIN, you should excise it to um, exclude invasive disease and to treat the lesion. And the ongoing treatment of lichen sclerosis with high dose steroids is important even after you've excised the deep in because there is this ongoing risk. Um, and certainly work that was done here and with the Dutch shows that the, the deep in is aggressive and it translates into worse survival than its HPV counterpart. So what about the role of HPV? I mean, certainly we know this is a, a series that we contributed to looking at geographical variations around the world. And we know that the warty or basaloid um, bin and the cancers tend to occur in younger women. And there's actually a shorter period of time at a mean age between the development of the non-HP related precursors to cancer than there is with the HPV. But also we've got, um, say, geographical variations around the world and your proportion of what's um, HPV related and non-HPV related disease will vary depending on where you were in the world. And where are we? There we go. Um, and this was some work, this was the, the subgroup of that bigger global study that was New Zealand data 
where we looked at the incidence of HPV prevalence within the precursors, and you can see 95% of our, what we call VIN, was HPV related. But when we got down to looking at cancers, the proportion had changed enormously, and they were about half and half, with sort of only just slightly more than half of the HPV independent cancers. So that, again, backs up the, the theory that your HPV independent um, precursors are far more aggressive than the others. And when we looked at the genotypes of the, what was interesting, of course, 16, 18, we all know about, but actually within the New Zealand population, we'd got 31, 33, 45. And they're important because they're the ones that are in Gardasil 9. And we've been vaccinating boys and girls with Gardasil 9 for some time now. So it's possible that we will get rid of HPV-related cancers. And therefore, we should be focusing on these independent cancers because vaccines take care of the rest. We don't need to worry about them. So that's it. So if we look at the independent, HPV independent precursors, and there was the sort of variants within that group. Um, as you know, work from here has recently um, changed the way that we think about these based again on the P53 mutation um, that shows that you've now got, rather than just the two, uh, negative and positive, we've now got a difference between the P53 mutation within the HPV independent group and the mutation of the wild type groups do behave very differently as well. And certainly we move to using this classification for our unit now. So it's given us a new direction of the way to think about vulvar cancers. And now instead of saying, right, yes, we've got the two groups, we probably should be looking at it in terms of the, the three groups. And we know that, that we've got this intermediate group now with the, the wild type. And the Dutch and the Germans have uh, pr produced data that that is consistent, and we see the same pattern across these studies. Um, however, we are still reporting overall incidence as one group. And if you look at all the studies that compare incidence throughout the world, none of them divide them into two different groups. And there's always this assumption that, that the incidence is either stable or increasing, and it's being driven by young women with HPV, and that older women present later, they're not fit enough for um, such radical treatment, and that's why they do worse. So in order to sort of try and explore this a little bit, um, we did a big review that was actually started by my predecessor, Ron Jones, and um, seemed to go on forever largely because Susan, I think, had to power way through over 6,000 slides to reclassify a lot of these tumours. But um, we looked back over a sort of nearly 30-year period of consecutive cases um, in our centre, and as I say, we treat half the vulvar cancers in the country. Um, we categorised them based on their precursor and then um, looked at incidence and then survival. And we had two different cohorts. One was included in the incidence um, and etiology side of things. And then the second paper was looking at the survival analysis. And we excluded all the people that we didn't have disease-specific data on before 2000. So since 2000, we could get the cause of death from the um, death registries. So they were included in the second group. And we found that actually people were presenting at roughly the same stage the whole way along. The majority of people will present with early stage disease. Um, so that hasn't really changed over time. So we're not necessarily any better at picking it up earlier than we were 30 years ago. And we're also no better at treating it either. So the mortality um, is sort of, I mean, say, I arrived in New Zealand, it was in 2008, so I like to think that the little downward slide is <laughs> possibly, but um, I doubt it. But what had changed was the proportion of HPV-independent cancers. Previously, we had the traditional two-thirds, as we've always been taught, but actually it had changed, and we've now got 
in the later half of the cohort. So the majority of our cancers were then HPV related. And part of this is probably due to the fact that sort of, I'm going to talk later about the, the vulval service that was set up in the mid 90s in Auckland and the use of topical steroids for liposclerosis that also came in in the mid 90s that may have accounted for some of these changes. But what was interesting is if you look at the graph on the left, if you look at the total, it didn't look like the etiology, uh, the incidence had changed at all. But if you broke them down into HPV and non-HPV, we've got a significant fall in the non-HPV and a significant rise in the HPV-related cancers. And then the graph on the right, it was actually in the older women that we'd got the significant increase in HPV-related cancers not in the younger women, which is what everyone has always assumed. So it's obviously the people who had been H cell sort of 20 years ago are now developing. So we're seeing that sort of change in behavior from 20, 30 years ago is now translating into more cancers. And certainly anecdotally, I see a lot of women in their 70s who've never had anything suddenly present with an HPV related mm. cancer, which we weren't seeing 10 years ago. So that has changed. Um, and then when we looked at all stages together, the HPV independent, independent group had a 25% worse five year survival <coughs> compared to the HPV group. And as we said, if we continue to put everyone together, we're gonna miss some of the nuances <coughs> within these groups. And actually we should be registering these separately. And as a result of this, we've now changed how we register patients on our MDM records to be HPV independent or HPV associated rather than just squamous cell. So we then went on to look to see, to test the theory that actually these HPV independent ones were doing worse because they were old women, maybe they weren't suitable for treatment, maybe they were presenting later um, and at a higher stage. So the objective the second part of the project was to, to look at that. Um, and if you look at the graphs on the left, the original data the, um, initially didn't seem anything surprising. We got the usual survival stage um, distribution and actually the older women did worse and the HPV independents were more common in the older women. Um, and we appeared to have a sort of difference in the age. However, when we then went into the multivariable analysis, we lost that association of age and it was no longer significant. However, what was significant was even at every stage, we had a difference in survival for um, with the HPV independent group doing worse. And it's almost like a sort of stage shift in terms of your, even your, we had no deaths at all in the stage one HPV associated group, but um, we did in the HPV independent group. So that, that was sort of at all stage and was completely independent of the stage and age. So actually it's the biology and why that's the question. And if you now look, we've got a world of data showing that both in terms of recurrence and in overall survival, our HPV independent tumors are doing worse. Now, we know that recurrence is a major prognostic factor. And if we look at the data from the groin study, um, we know that you are more likely to have a local recurrence. In, if you have a local recurrence early, you're more likely to die. So if you recur within that first two years, that's a bad prognostic factor. So we know that you are likely to have a, the, the groin state was a 30% survival of five years, 40% by, by 10 years, and that rate increases if you're nodal positive. We also know data from here and from the Dutch that HPV independent tumors have more recurrences. So you already got this sort of bad prognostic feature and that they tend to recur earlier than the HPV independent uh, associated group. Um, and we showed from our data in Birmingham in the UK 
that yes, you've got a much higher chance if you've got a tumor with a background of differentiated VIM, you are more likely to get a recurrence, but you're also more likely to get multiple recurrences. So you don't just recur once. And certainly you see anecdotally, we have these women who recur five, six, seven times um, on the background of differentiated VIM. And we also know that the HPV independent tumors, again, data from you, and um, shows that we've got more radio resistance with the HPV independent group. So this idea of we sort of sterilize the field with close margins and that sorts it out is a complete misnomer because most of these are in-field occurrences. So we moved away as a result of this from irradiating HPV negative patients because it didn't seem to work. Um, and certainly I would say this is true for our unit in the fact that recurrent HPV independent vulval cancer is probably our most common indication for pelvic exenteration these days. And we do more vulvas than anything else. Um, so Paul Cohen and, uh, is a um, professor in Perth and we sort of did a review looking at see if we can try and work out what to, well, to review the literature around the sort of differences in the molecular classifiers. And as I say, there's suggestion, the evidence does show that we've got these underlying different molecular authorizations in the precursors that are probably accounting for these differences in biology. And certainly that it continues into the, the cancers as well. And this was some of the early work from the Dutch looking at, if you look at the sort of top line indicators of HPV on the graph, you see there's relatively few mutations in the group that um, were HPV positive, whereas a lot more mutations in the group that are HPV negative. And this is true for both the precursors and for the cancers. And then if you divide the P53, which seems to be one of the most relevant ones into the wild type and the negative group, as we've shown before, it impacts on your recurrence. So we've seen the graphs before showing survival, but this is also true for recurrence. So you're more likely to get a recurrence with a P53 mutation. And you, well, the um, Dutch also then showed that using immunohistochemistry of P16, P53, you can classify this group and it's both the recurrence um, risk and your overall survival that the P53 mutation group are definitely an outlier compared to the other two. And actually the wild type group performed in a very similar way to the HPV positive group within this series. Um, and molecular markers, again, if you put your P16 and just do it without looking at HPV itself, um, you've got the same um, patterns emerging in virtually every study that's looked at this. And your group here has also then looked at other genes and found that there are differences between them. <clears throat> so the Austrians then went to look at whether you were more likely to die early if you'd got a mutation and the answer was you were. And again, the wild type behaved in a similar way to the HPV associated group, whereas a third of the P53 mutated group were dead by 12 months. And in actual fact, their time to recurrence was half that of the wild type group as well. And what was interesting, I thought, in this paper was that the recurrence with it that have occurred didn't necessarily have the same mutation. And if you started off with a wild type mutation, you norm, uh, uh, with a wild type P53 in your original tumor, if you recurred, there was often a P53 mutation in the recurrence. So they did mutate with different genes, which shows that you've got this sort of chronic inflammatory dermatosis that's genetically unstable. So when we're talking about recurrences, we need to distinguish between the types. So you've got a true local recurrence, which is your original tumour and your recurrence is the same cells from your original tumour. You've then got what we call a second field tumour, 
which is where you've got a related field. So for instance, lichen sclerosis, and you develop a field, uh, a, a second field tumor within that lichen sclerosis field, but it's not clonally related to your first tumor. And then you've got a complete second primary tumor that occurs completely independent of your first one many years later. And the group in Birmingham, after I left, have shown that your second field tumours actually are highly significantly associated with the field of lichen sclerosis, but also tend to occur earlier than your true local recurrences. So your timeline for peaking for your second field tumours is normally a couple of years before you actually get a local recurrence. So the question is, is whether we should be expanding the field that we're treating to try and prevent some of this from happening. So this may explain why we've now got data that show that the traditional eight millimeters that was based on one very small paper out of Sydney about 30 years ago that everyone has taken as law. Um, we don't seem to have this prognostic um, indication for these margins anymore. And so the idea of that you need to take at least a centimeter to get an eight millimeter after it's shrunk has sort of gone out the window to a certain degree. Um, but your data did show that when you changed to less radical surgery, it didn't seem to make any difference for your HPV associated tumors, but your HPV independent tumors did worse. And actually you've got the precursor's margin, that was also significant. So maybe the extent of surgery is important. Um, and also you've shown that the group in um, Leipzig that did these big radical field resections didn't seem to have the difference in the outcome between the two groups, but they're using an embryological resection margin rather than an anatomical one. And this is um, one of our fellows who's just presented this at the IGCS this year, where we looked at the margins. Um, so Marilyn had done this as part of her master's, trying to look at the margins of HPV associated independent tumors. And we found that we have a much lower recurrence rate in the HPV associated tumors. And the margins of any distance weren't associated with any form of recurrence. Um, and certainly in the univariable analysis, we found that the HPV independent margins of less than, close margins of less than eight millimeters were associated with an increased recurrence, but we did lose the significance in the multivariable analysis, although there was still a trend. Um, so this is something that needs sort of a bit more work. And the Dutch have shown that if you've got differentiated VIN, particularly within a field of lichen sclerosis, which is the green line at the top of that graph, you are more likely to have recurrences. Um, differentiated VIN, which is the yellow line on its own, is also more significant than the HPV red line down at the bottom. So, so this was looking at precursors at the, at the surgical margins, which seem to be more relevant than the cancer margins. And again, work from, I feel like I'm, taking the course of Newcastle really hard. Well, this comes from here anyway, but um, so showed that your recurrence rates and disease specific survival was more relevant with P53 and DVIM at the margins and your time to recurrence again, it's shorter depending on what you've got at the margin. However, despite all of this knowledge that we have, we still haven't changed the mortality. Um, and it's the same throughout the world. So we, should we be challenging what we're doing? With what we've done, we've done the same old, same old, it, it hasn't changed. So over the years in Auckland, we've, I thought I'd just run through what's routine practice for us, because it's always sort of useful to compare to other units. So um, that's my department. <laughs> uh, we, we, that we have three cancer centres within New Zealand. Um, there's Auckland, which treats basically half the population. We have a population of just over five, five and a half million now. 
and we treat about two and a half to three million population that are centred in the upper North Island. And then Wellington, which is at the bottom of the South Island, has about a million's population, and then Christchurch treats the South Island, which also has a million population. So they're my three lovely colleagues, they're Cecile from France, and Tom from Belgium, and Salifas from Fiji, and trained with us. And then underneath, we've got Ros and Angie, who are our CNSs. We have one fellow and two residents, and um, that's us. So we also have the lovely Taryn, who is the um, colposcopy charge nurse. Who, so Ron Jones established the regional vulval clinic in the mid nineties. And so a lot of it's in the, located in the colposcopy unit and we have two to three vulval clinics a week. Um, and we have the ability to photograph everyone. It's multidisciplinary. I'm very lucky I have a dermatologist who works alongside us as well. And we have access to sexual health and to physio and psychology as long as you're prepared to wait six months to see them. But, um, but most of the patients, well, certainly all the pre-invasive disease will come through this unit and some of the cancers come through as well, or they come through the gynaeal um, referral system. And in terms of our clinic documentation, this was um, designed by Darren Rowan, who was the previous dermatologist who was there. So it's all paper, uh, well, it's paper that then goes into an electronic record. And we also use the um, quality of life scores. So this was a publication that was developed in Australia and uh, the patients were all given it in the waiting room and you get a score out of 45. So you can instantly see as they walk in sort of if they've got very bad symptoms or minor symptoms and you've got a quantitative measure to score them from, from each visit. To, so you can assess your um, treatment. Um, and this was published last year, and this is roughly what we've been doing for the last five years. So it was quite nice that ESCO have validated us um, in the fact that the, with the margin data, we'd stopped doing going for the, the massive resections to make sure that we've got um, one centimetre histological margins of it and we have been um, tailoring resections to include the cancers and the precancers and as I say the optimal radicality does remain to be defined. Um, in terms of what we do in theatre um, everyone is photographed and there's a camera in theatre and the photos are then uploaded onto the electronic record um, there's diagrams, there's also the, the written diagrams that get uploaded onto the electronic record that includes details of both resections and reconstruction. And then all our specimens are pinned out onto a cork board. We put the paper towel underneath so that the formalin um, keeps the pathologist happy and they go off down to the lab. So we've got a photograph of what the specimen looks like in situ and, and what it looks like on the board. So when the pathologists report a margin, I go, well, where is it? And they go, there. So you go, okay, fine. We need to go back and re-get re that bit. Um, and so we tend to photograph before and after so that the nurses have also got a baseline photograph of what it's meant to look like when it falls apart a week later. Um, and we also document sort of the pre-invasive. So we tailor, so you've got a big tumor on the left, pre-invasive disease on the right. And so we would um, document what we've resected where. Um, we tend to do a lot of small flaps for even small lesions. So rather than sort of tie things together that's really tight. Um, and we would um, document where the bits were and where they've moved from. So again, when you, if you've got a positive margin in someone that you've reconstructed, it, then you know where, where you're going back to. And so, and then we tend to take photos in clinic later on when they healed. Um, so this is a, a bigger resection of someone who actually had 13 cancers within her. She was a liver transplant um, drug user who would got um, multiple cancers all over the place and a slightly chaotic lifestyle, but she came back regularly 
felt what she failed in Michael Maud and we finished up doing a big skinning resection on her and actually found 13 early cancers in there. But it meant that we could then document where, because when the margins come back positive, there's no point just going back and re-excising the bit that used to be on her thigh, because that's not actually going to help. So I think for us, the photos and the diagrams make a big difference. And we have the photos available to us on an electronic record in theatre. So if we have then had someone who's had multiple resections, we can go back and see where we took skin from last time and go somewhere different this time. Um, so again, more documentation of the, the size of it and pinning it out to send off to the um, lab and documenting where the urethra involved. We tend to test using a pair of forceps. How, what you, if you open it up and go up the urethra, when the urine starts flowing, you don't go further than that. So that also enables us to um, record how much urethra we've taken each time. So we know that if we're going back later on, at which point we're going to run into trouble. Um, and again, more photos of sort of the flaps that gives the nurses an idea of what, what they're looking after as well. And the diagrams, again, all get scanned into the notes so that we, we know where we're, where we're at. And it is a team sport. Um, our nurses are brilliant. I mean, they start in the clinic. So, I mean, generally, if a patient is referred to us, by the Friday, they're, all patients go through our MDM. So they're discussed the following Wednesday and we have a telehealth, um, well, it's a video conference to the eight referring hospitals that come into our centre. Um, and so if there's a patient that we need, so all the path and the imaging is reviewed and then we see the patient the next day and then they're normally given a date for theatre within a couple of weeks after that. But we've got the anaesthetist in clinic, we've got the nurses in clinic, and they will go through all of a, a needs assessment with the patient if they need care, if they're coming from around the country, they talk about the wound care afterwards. And the most important thing is that they have the nurse's phone number to contact them if they've got any problems. And even after we sort of discharge patients or sort of they're on follow up, they have a, a number that they can ring that if they've got symptoms, we will just see them straight back and they don't need to go back through primary care to be referred. Um, the nurses use a lot of photos as well. So if the wounds break down, when the wounds break down, they can document the depth of it and what they're packing. And um, they use a lot of iodine based um, dressings for the, the, the deeper wounds. And um, credit to Ros and Claudia, who was our previous CNS, they've just written the Vulcan chapter for the IGCS um, nursing program. And so there's a lot of the information and a lot of photos, et cetera, that they put on there. And we've, we've just finished that. Um, in terms of follow-up, uh, about five years ago, we started changing our follow-up when we realized the HPV associated ones were much um, less likely to recur. So they uh, we see them for five years and then they're discharged, whereas the HPV independent ones we keep for life. And um, most of the patients at our post-op, we'd see them back, but we'd write to them or phone them with their results after a couple of weeks. Um, all the lichen sclerosis and the deviant patients get restarted on the dermal as soon as they're healed. And as I say, the most important thing is the fact that if they develop symptoms between their visits, they contact the either Guyne York CNS or Taryn and Cole with the expectation that we will see them in clinic within a week. So they don't need to go back to their GP um, to get back into clinic. So those are our main changes to practice over the probably the last four or five years that we've sort of started routinely using P16 and P53 to classify the tumors and recording them separately in our, our data. We've stopped re-excising margins. We've stopped irradiating the independent, HPV independent ones. And those ones we'd rather re-excise and irradiate, which has meant we've used more exemptive surgery for those. And obviously we've tailored our follow-up protocols 
and instigated the sort of SOS number for the nurses. Um, so there's a Mori um, Potoki, which is a sort of motto that says that you sort of, you, you look back and you can reflect in order to move forward. And the problem is that all our data is retrospective. Um, and that's what we're basing things on. So we're very excited about Strive and hopefully we can get and collaborate and, and get this moving forward. Um, we've had a lot of input from people in both Australia and New Zealand. So I acknowledge all the people who've been involved in trying to get this off the ground. Um, and our current position is ANSCOG has agreed to sponsor the Australian New Zealand components of it. And we've got some seed funding um, from both ANSCOG and Gracie, which is a charity in New Zealand. And we're waiting for the final protocol. So our ethics hopefully will get soon and hopefully we can um, get things moving this year. So thanks very much.